Hello and welcome to Hispanic Agenda. I'm Alejandro Negron. This is Washington's only bilingual news program. Thank you for watching and happy Easter. Today on the agenda, the controversy continues over two new schools for English language learners in Prince George's County. Telemundo Washington's Claudia Curiel will join us in a few minutes with a, an update on that story and what the leader of the NAACP in that Maryland County said this time about why he opposes the schools. But first, New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez was indicted this week on federal corruption charges. Here's ABC's David Wright. Cheered on by his supporters, the New Jersey Democrat defiantly vowed to clear his name against those shocking bribery and corruption charges. I'm angry because prosecutors at the Justice Department don't know the difference between friendship and corruption. At issue is his friendship with this man, Dr. Salomon Melgan, a Florida ophthalmologist. According to the indictment filed Wednesday, the doctor used the senator as sort of a personal errand boy on Capitol Hill, getting Menendez to intervene in a billing dispute over Medicare charges worth millions of dollars, getting him to push the State Department to help one of the doctor's business ventures, and even allegedly helping the doctor's girlfriends with their visa problems. In exchange, according to the indictment, the senator accepted hundreds of thousands of dollars in campaign funds from Melgan, plus lavish Caribbean holidays, deluxe hotel rooms in Paris, and expensive trips on board the doctor's private jet. The last time a U.S. senator faced bribery charges was 1980, the Abscam investigation that inspired the movie American Hustle. I like you, I had an eye, we can do business together, that's fine. Menendez insists the FBI is out to get him. They are dead wrong, and this is not how my career is going to end. Yeah. That abscam senator was a New Jersey Democrat, too. In fact, Menendez now holds his seat. He says he has no plans to resign, but he will step down temporarily as ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. David Wright, ABC News, Newark. Thank you, David. And now I want to welcome Roxana Casares, co-chair of the Latino Leaders Network, the same organization that in 2004 honored then-Congressman Bob Menendez with its Eagle Leadership Award. Roxana, welcome to the program. Welcome back to Hispanic Agenda. Yes, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. It's a pleasure to, to have you on. So this is a very sad news to Absolutely. know that uh, someone that is uh, beloved by the community, as, as, as Senator Menendez uh, is, I mean, this is a very important uh, man when it comes to the history of Latino political power or the history of Latinos gaining that political Absolutely. power. So this is very sad and we've seen a very swift uh, response from l different Latino leaders mm -hmm. defending him. Absolutely. When I look at that report, it's, it, it, you know, you tend to be believe everything you hear. You know, maybe this is another corrupt uh, politician. Why are you guys so... Well, I think let's remember what Senator Menendez has done for the Latino community. And one of the things is he was in the Gang of Eight supporting and pushing for immigration reform. Yeah. One of our Latino leaders. Let's not make this a political issue. Let's make let's make sure it's a just and fair trial. You think this is a political witch hunt? The senator uh, believes that. Well, I think it's become a very political thing. I think we're, we're judging already without making sure the process is done. What, what, what would be the motive, uh, let's say, for those who want to hurt him uh, politically or have something against him? What, what is their motive? Well, I don't want to feed into the political. I want to remember what and what he has done for the Latino community and what he will continue to do to make sure we have full access to health care service, to mm -hmm. small business growth, He's done so much for civil rights for our Latino community, not only the Latino community, but diversity as a whole. But that wouldn't necessarily excuse him if he, if in no, fact, is not. guilty of, of, of what he's being accused of. Now, what, what is it and that maybe you know, other organizations know? I mean, he's gotten support from basically Janet. every major mm -hmm. uh, Latino group, national group in, in the United States. What do they know that maybe the rest of the public? Uh, well, I think one doesn't. of the things where our large organizations, our national organizations like Mickey Barra or Janet sure. Murguia have come out to support is because we know what. Mr. Senator Melendez has done for our community. And we don't want to make this a political issue. We want it to be a fair and just trial. And I think that's the theme for all the national Latino leaders right now. You know, this is very interesting. Uh, 
because there are some other folks that are defending uh, Senator Bud Menendez. I wouldn't say necessarily defending Bud Menendez, but attacking the Obama administration uh, Justice Department for the indictment, uh, including uh, Republican Senator uh, Ted Cruz and, Ted and, Cruz. and others who basically accused the Obama administration of um, allowing this indictment to go forward uh, because of his position on the Iran uh, negotiation, on the Cuba negotiation. What do you feel about Well, I don't know if this is such an attack from the Obama administration because I know Senator Menendez has helped with the health care, um, yeah. Obamacare, with assisting to make sure or push for the immigration reform to possibly happen. So I don't know if that's more of a rumor. Okay than anything else. Or politicians a, a political taking advantage of yes. a situation uh, for their own benefit. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you, Roxana, uh, for your time. Thank it's a you. pleasure to have you on, and, and we'll revisit this issue, I'm Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Roxana. When we come back, the head of the NAACP in Prince George's County raises concerns over segregation because of two new schools for English language learners and whom he thinks should be considered English language learners. You don't want to miss a special report when Hispanic Agenda continues. Welcome back to Hispanic Agenda, I'm Alejandro Negron, and now we want to follow up on those two new schools for English language learners set to open in August by the Prince George's County Public School System. While there, there are many who will benefit from the services these schools will provide and they have expressed their support, not everyone thinks it's fair that English language learners are getting their own school. Telemundo Washington's Claudia Curiel is here with more. Claudia. Well, despite a bit of controversy, two ELL, or English Language Learner Schools, will be opening next fall in the D.C. area, aimed at helping students from other countries who don't dominate the English language. And the application process has started, and they seem to be so popular that there might not be room for everyone that wants to attend. Edith Romero is raising her niece, who she says is like her daughter. Madeline came to the United States from El Salvador seven months ago to escape the gangs in her country. They came to her house wanting to kill her mother, so her mother solicited a visa and thank God they gave one, but just to her, and they had to send her to live with me because she was at risk over there. Like her, there are many students who have a hard time transitioning to a new country, especially because of the language. Because of this, she's excited for two new schools that will be opening in Prince George's County in Maryland in August. And they're designed especially for English language learners. It's very difficult for her because she doesn't know how to communicate with the teachers. But then I heard about the new school, and then I was told the teachers will be bilingual, and I thought, this I like. However, opening these schools hasn't been that easy. The president of the Prince George's chapter of the NAACP, an association that defends the civil rights of African Americans, has said that this is segregating students and that this is a problem that also affects his community. In fact, of both on the Hispanic side as well as on the African American side, because we are English language learners uh, historically, because English never really was our native tongue. And that's why our graduation rate it suffers because we have not mastered the English language. Nonetheless, the schools will open next year with 200 students each. Tehani Collazo from Casa de Maryland explains they have already received 120 applications and are receiving 10 to 15 more each day. If we get past 200 students who enroll, who submit an application, then we'll open up for a lottery and then it will be, the students will be chosen randomly. Carlos Beato, director of one of the schools, says the main goal is for these students to have the same opportunities to succeed. Currently we have a 20% gap in our graduation rate between ESOL students and general education students and what we're looking to do with these schools is to close that achievement gap and it could be a student who just arrived in the country two weeks ago but it's also for a student that's been in the county and has had a little difficulty in learning the English language. And I now want to welcome Claudia Curiel from Telemundo Washington. Thank you for being here. Thank you Alejandro. Let me see if I got this correct. Mm -hmm. Did Bob Ross just say that African Americans should also be considered English language learners because historically English isn't their native tongue. That is correct. That's exactly what you heard. <laughs> that is, that's what he said. You know, I was just surprised as you were, to say the least. Um, I Did I hear that out of context? Is, is, there, is there any further explanation that we didn't show there? No, I mean, he, he said that, to be honest, like, you know, that was one of the, 
the few full sentences that he said to me when I was interviewing him. You okay. know, he would kind of digress a little bit when I even asked him the questions. Now, I understand that there's, you know, uh, concerns uh, over segregation. I mean, these schools are set, you know, for immigrant students, English language learners. The majority are going to be Latino students. But like Casa de Maryland says, it's not only about Latinos. There's other um, uh, nation uh, nationali nationalities are, that will attend, right? I mean, these students, they don't have to be Hispanic. They can be from Europe, from Africa, from Asia. It doesn't matter, mm -hmm. you know. And um, he has this argument that it's segregating students, and he's trying to use Brown versus Board of Education. Sure. But at the end of the day, it's not mandatory. They're not separating these students, saying you have to go here, you have to go there. The students and the parents, they want that because they want it. They want that individual attention so that it's easier for them to learn. And we are following up on, on this story. We've mm -hmm. covered it uh, at length, and we've had the organizers and the uh, school administrators uh, for these schools here. And basically what they say is, listen, we're going to try different things in these schools to see if we can uh, help those kids uh, learn easier or, or better and take those strategies and implement them in other schools inside of the county, correct? Right. I mean, well, one is going to be a school within a school in Largo High School, and the mm -hmm. other is going to be a standalone. But this isn't something new or innovative or, or different. You know, this is a, something that they're taking from other schools mm -hmm. in the country that has proven to work and to be successful. All right. Thank you, Claudia Curiel, and she'll stick around for the roundtable. Stay with Hispanic Agenda coming up. He's a spiritual leader to more than a billion Catholics around the world. But did you know that Pope Francis is also a songwriter? Welcome back to Hispanic Agenda. I'm Alejandro Negron. Happy Easter weekend. Let me welcome this week's roundtable from ABC7 News, Jeanette Reyes and Claudia Curiel from Telemundo, Washington. While at the moment the Republican brand isn't very popular among Hispanics, whom many political observers believe uh, those are self-inflicted wounds by the GOP, the GOP is, as of now, the only major political party to have two Latino presidential hopefuls, Senator Ted Cruz and Senator Marco Rubio. A Republican pollster says that Rubio is the only candidate that can take back the White House for the GOP. Why? Let's get into it with the roundtable. All right, Jeanette Reyes and Claudia Curiel. Uh, Jeanette, I'll start with you. Um, so Latinos, if Latinos were to give the presidential candidate for the Republican Party at least 40% mm -hmm. of their support, they basically can take back the White House. That's uh, what this pollster uh, says. Is Marco Rubio the guy then? Well, with Marco Rubio, one, one of the advantages that he has is that he is young. The Latino population tends to be much younger. He's very charismatic. He's mm -hmm. fluent in Spanish. He's very proud of his Cuban roots and speaks of it, flu uh, speaks of it often. Right. And that's something that Hispanics can connect to. Mm -hmm. However, uh, he, I think he really needs to find a way to be more vocal and make his mark. He hasn't seemed to, to have done that just yet. Right. You have someone like Jeb Bush. His wife is Mexican-American, and right. he's, well, he's more well-known. When you think of Florida, you think mm -hmm. of politicians, you think of Jeb Bush before you think of Marco Rubio. Of course. You know, he was an ex-governor of, of that state. But Mar Marco Rubio, like Jeanette says, uh, the poster makes the case that it's not only because he's Hispanic, it's also because he's young. Right. I mean, and Latinos are the youngest demographic in the United States. And not only that, I mean, uh, for a long time, the, Repu the Republican Party has had a hard time connecting with the young population, not just the Hispanic youth, but the youth in general. That's a very good point. And Hispanics. And, you know, he is different from other candidates because, like Jenna said, you know, he's young, he's charismatic, has personality, and he's a son of immigrant parents. You know, he represents the American dream. His mother was a maid, his father was a bartender, mm -hmm. and now he could potentially run for president. And he can tackle certain issues that other Republican exactly. candidates have had. It, you know, problems with, and like the, immigration uh, and others. On the flip side, too, you have uh, someone like Ted Cruz, for example, who's right. also of Cuban descent, born in Canada, but still, uh, he, he's, he is eligible to run for president. Someone like Ted Cruz is, is rather extreme. You know, he really appeals to the Tea Party, but not right. so much to the establishment. When you have someone like Marco Rubio, he really does a great job of straddling both sides. And he could um, do well in the in the general election versus just in the primary. Exactly. Uh, which would assume Ted Cruz is going to do well in certain states like Iowa, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other thing that I guess we have to, they have to watch out for, is that candidates like Ted Cruz don't move the other candidates to the extreme right to the point that they become unelectable. Right. Uh, later on in the general election. All right, uh, great insights. Now, let me ask you, so I didn't know this. Uh, you know, whether you're Catholic or not, I think you can appreciate what this pope has done um, for people all across uh, the world, and specifically uh, for Catholics, Pope Francis. Mm -hmm. Now he's a songwriter. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, I mean, I, we're I, always talking about the Pope. Yeah. He always finds a way for us to talk about the Pope in, in positive ways. I think that's great. I mean, he's obviously proven himself to be different, more unique. He's more open-minded than previous popes in the past. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's something going on now that people are calling the Franciscan fever, right? Yeah. Because um, some priests are saying that there's a bigger attendance rate of Hispanics in mass because they have a Hispanic pope. And right. so sometimes they even have to have simultaneous masses in Spanish within a church and in a gym, in a classroom, if the church is in a, in a school. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they even put speakers outside in the parking lot so people can hear the mass in their cars. And I think they haven't shown so much love for a pope since John Paul II. And I it's not just Catholics. It's people everywhere have favorable things to say about him. Ab about this pope. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Jeanette, it, even in Latin America, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, lately, uh, you know, more Protestant uh, churches, um, non-Catholic uh, churches are becoming so popular, right. you know, they're winning back some of those Catholics that left. Yeah, you know you're making a difference when you are appealing to atheist Protestants. Right. You're winning back Catholics who, okay. uh, with some of the ca scandals in the Catholic Church, kind of lost hope right. in the church, and he's really done a great job. I think politicians could learn something right. from him as well. I have, <laughs> to, I have to go. Thank you so much, Thank Clara Curella and Jeanette Reyes. Stay with Hispanic Agenda. We'll be right back with much more. Welcome back to Hispanic Agenda. I'm Alejandro Negron. One of the most controversial parts of Obamacare is the individual mandate. If you fail to get health insurance, you will pay a penalty. Many were surprised by these penalties or fines when they filed their tax returns recently. But some could qualify for an extension and avoid paying those penalties. I recently spoke with Rosalia Fajardo and Lenny Gonzalez of Enroll Virginia, a nonpartisan community-based effort to educate Virginians about the new health care law. Here it is. So we want to first talk about this extension. So why did we get an extension in, in Virginia for the open enrollment? We have an extension for those individuals, the federal government with a federal marketplace, federally funded marketplace, and we have an extension for those individuals who are finding now when they're filing their taxes that they have to pay a, pay a fine. This is a law. And if you don't fulfill the law, right. you get a penalty, and the penalty goes in your taxes. And this has been a cause for concern in the Hispanic uh, community, the fact that they're going to have to be paying uh, penalties. Apparently, uh, some got a, uh, a not-so-pleasant surprise, and this is the reason why it was extended? And yes. Exactly. Right. Yes, this is the reason it was extended, and also it's giving the opportunity to the person who is subject to this fee to then be able to enroll and get insurance and not have to pay again the penalty or the full penalty in the 2015 tax. Now, let me, let me ask you, the penalty in 2014, the average, I guess, was about $285? For a family with a certain income. Per person is $95 per adult, $47.50 per children, or 1% of your household income as is declared in the tax. Now in 2016 that's projected to be $695 yes. per adult. So people really need to pay attention to this. Now yes. let me get Rosalia in here. Uh, you're an in-person assistant. Your job is to help folks navigate through the system, Step correct? 101, yes. That's what I do. Lene is sending me the consumers and I help them. I sit down with them and help them to navigate and understand uh, how they they can afford and enroll into the and to have an insurance. And I guess what type of documents they will need in order to Absolutely. qualify for the yes. I do subsidies. Verify, yes, I do verify. I, I, that's also part of my function is verify that they have the appropriate documentation in, in order for them to be enrolled. And I guess uh, one of the things that you guys want to do is communicate to folks that they can contact you directly. We're going to yes. be showing uh, yes. a few phone, a phone numbers number. on the screen now yes. uh, so that folks can call you and ask. Uh, make questions. And yeah. Yeah, and make, make appointments. Yeah. What, what type of questions do you get the most? We're getting a lot of questions about why do I have to pay this? People can do for, well, again, Why do I have to pay the penalty? The penalty yeah. is mm -hmm. the law, or, or they're getting very surprised, or they're beginning to hear, thanks to programs like this, that there is a chance for them to enroll so they can do it. And they don't even have to pay the, 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 the fine yet. They have to be subject to the fine, to the $90 fine or whatever is going to mm -hmm. be the amount. But they have to do it. Remember, the taxes are due on April 15, and this period is extended mm -hmm. of enrolling until April 30th. So 
they can do it, they can pay their fine mm -hmm. or start the process. They can even do two things at the same that time. The they time. come with us and then they go and do their taxes. They have to do their taxes. Okay. And now it's important for people to be educated also on the fact that having health insurance has many uh, positive effects to, to your life. Uh, that is not only about paying a, a penalty, correct? Yeah. I, it's, it's always, you know, I'm, I'm talking with the people and because they can say, well, I'd rather prefer to pay the penalty. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, right, it's, now it's $95, but you never know when you are going to have an emergency. That's true. And the bill will be not 95 but $10,000 at the minimum. Okay. And the insurance, the dispense insurance uh, is not never far ten thousand dollars per year all right well, one. i want to thank you both for being here uh, miss uh, rosalia fajardo and lenny gonzalez our friend thank, thank you, you both for being here and thank we you. encourage everyone to call the numbers that appear on your screen at this yes. moment we are ready and they're ready to help ready. yes well thank you both thank you thank you, thank you so much well that's all the time we have for agenda this week please check out our facebook page Hispanic Agenda, follow us on Twitter at Agenda underscore DC and at Alejandro Negron. Be sure to catch the Spanish version of this program on Telemundo Washington and be sure to tune in next week for more of Hispanic Agenda here on News Channel 8. Have a great weekend.